All right, everyone. Welcome back to the uh, research portion, uh, research papers portion of the conference. Uh, our first speaker is Robert Ayer. He uh, attended the University of Florida and has a BS in statistics and a master's in systems and industrial engineering. He's an alumnus of the MIT Sloan School of Management. And he's currently works in corporate strategy at Corefire. Um, also, just, just so you know, uh, when we have the Q&A portion, please line up in the back where there's a mic, um, and that'll be, uh, that'll be better. Um, so please welcome, please join me in welcoming uh, Robert. Well, thanks everyone for coming to the presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, big twos and big threes, analyzing uh, how an NBA team's best players complement each other. So. I, I think it's something we've thought a lot about uh, as fans. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about how to best put together big twos and big threes in the NBA. And frankly, you know, the acquisition of the most talented players on, your, on a team are among the most, most important decisions a team can make. Uh, so I, I think it's relevant. And you know, I, the, the research sort of sought to sort of analytically determine player type combinations that have a statistically significant effect on win. So as fans, we have a lot of intuition around, you know, which teams sort of fit well together, which don't. But just wanted to uh, take a data-oriented approach at this and sort of more rigorously look at which combinations work best together. And so just so you know, when I'm talking about player type groups, um, you know, that third bullet there, player type examples, just think, you know, for instance, a pass first low scoring point guard, three point shooting power forward, or a multifaceted wing. So when I, when I refer to sort of player types, that's sort of the kind of thing I'm talking about. So the motivation here, uh, you know, thinking about it, I think a lot of us, you know, our favorite teams, you know, think about draft picks that, you know, we thought had a lot of talent but maybe didn't pan out or a free agent acquisition that didn't live up to expectations uh, at a team level, teams that underperform. Uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, it's not due to talent not due to coaching, it's just the pieces uh, at the top level, at the top of the team, just don't fit well together. Additionally, I, I think another uh, thing you can think about is players who, uh, who are versatile, who have different skill sets that, that can play different positions. You know, you think about on their current team, what style should they play? What position should they play? I think a good example of that is, you know, a LeBron James. He can, he's a guy who probably can play four different positions at an all-star level. You know, for whatever team he's on, which style should he play? What position should he play? I think another good example uh, that's relevant is think about uh, Russell Westbrook. You know, he plays point guard now, but if you look at his skill set, you know, you might view him as playing off the ball or sort of a Dwayne Wade type of player. So which one would fit better on his current team? So that's sort of the motiv motivation and just thinking about why, you know, certain teams or players underperform. And so uh, sort of the basis of the research was, you know, to look at you know, what I thought were the three primary components to winning. So that's, you know, overall talent, coaching quality, and team fit, which is, you know, the, the focus of the paper. Wanted to look at talent and coaching quality because I wanted to tease out those so we could look specifically at uh, the team fit variables. So talent and coaching quality is straightforward. We know the more talent a team has, the better they're going to be. Better coaching that a team has, uh, the more wins they're going to have. Team fit is a little less straightforward, but I think as fans, we sort of have an intuition around that. Uh, this is going to give sort of a brief example that, that I think describes the uh, contribution of team fit to win. So if you just think about a team that had a big three of Derrick Rose, Russell Westbrook, and Rajon Rondo, coached by Greg Popovich. So three obviously very, you know, extremely talented players and a high quality coach. But you know, most you know fans would you know look at that team and sort of in, intuitively deduce that you know those three players are very similar and are likely not to fit well. And that doesn't mean that team is not going to win a lot of games, just on, just by the sheer force of their talent, they're going to win a lot of games. But you know, if you compare them to an equally talented team whose pieces fit better, they're going to underperform. And so that's sort of what you know, sort of the uh, things we want to tease out in in this. Uh, the study here. So, and we, we talked a little bit about, you know, our intuition and, and things like that. And, you know, one of the purposes of the paper is to look at conventional wisdom and see where we can confirm or reject it. I think one big uh, point of conventional wisdom as far as team fit is concerned is 
uh, that duplicative players don't fit well together. So we, you know, that's something we think, that's something that we just take as a given. And like I said, you know, one of the purposes of the paper is to sort of look at conventional wisdom like that and sort of confirm it or reject it and hopefully uh, uncover some other interesting insights along the way. So from a methodology uh, point of view, I looked at historical team data uh, beginning in 1977. That's when uh, the data has, you know, pretty much all of the stats that we were sort of, you know, used to looking at, particularly turnovers and blocks. So that's, that's when I started the, uh, the data set. And I wanted to develop a, a model which determined expected wins from the following variables, and I talked about them. Team talent, coaching quality, and team fit. So you're going to have actually two models, actually, that look similar to that, uh, that model at the bottom. So one model for the big twos, one model for the big threes. And so what we're going to be looking at are specifically the coefficients that C in the team fit. So those are, that's going to give us the contribution, all else being equal, that's going to give us a contribution to wins due to the fit of the team. So that's all well and good, but you know, I guess one issue is how do we quantify these things? So you know, we realize that that would make a, a good model, but we have to quantify them so we could put it in a data set and, uh, and, and fit a model. So I'm going to talk about how I quantified each of those uh, variables in the next few slides. So first team fit, constructing two and three main combinations. So the players first need to be grouped into appropriate player type groups. So for instance, high scoring, high usage, shooting guards like a Kobe Bryant or Dwayne Wade likely to be in the same group as well as, you know, three point shooting specialists like a Steve Kerr or Dale Curry. Those guys are going to be in the same group. So, uh, but you know, yeah, we know that, but you know, you want, you got thousands of players and you want to sort of analytically group these, these guys. So I use a clustering algorithm based on the statistical similarity of these variables here. I won't go through them all, but uh, there are, I believe, 14, 14 different statistics there. And the players were run through the cl clustering algorithm and grouped according to their overall statistical similarity based on these set of variables. So as far as the clustering is concerned, there are a lot of different ways you can go. A lot of the clustering algorithms are result in groups that are very hierarchical. So, and you know, in this case, you would have like your you know, elite groups, your all-star groups, you know, your starters, your role players, your you know, uh, NBDL type players, but I didn't want that. So I, I wanted the groups to be uh, somewhat talent agnostic. One of the reasons is that I, I already account for talent. So I want the groups uh, to really not really recognize talent. So I want sort of a top level guy, top level two guard, to be in the same group as a sort of mid-level two guard who sort of does the same things, but just not as well. And so I was pretty much able to do that. I guess one exception was the, the group that corresponded to the sort of legendary centers, sort of like your Elijah Juan, David Robinson, those types. Of, and those types of guys are just so unique. Their statistical profiles are so extraordinarily unique that it's just impossible to put anybody else in their group. Uh, you know, conversely, you know, we think about the sort of the, the group that a Kobe Bryant or a Dwayne Wade would be in. You can more easily put, you know, sort of second level guys like a uh, you know, Steve Francis or somebody like that in that group because uh, Steve Francis, he does pretty much the same things that a Kobe Bryant is just not as well. So it's easier to put those guys in a group. So I was able to get those, those groups pretty, you know, pretty much talent agnostic except that one group with the centers because they're just so unique. And so here are the player types and descriptions. And so certainly not going to go through all of these, but I'm going to point out just a few of them that are relevant for, uh, you know, in, in late, later in the paper. I talked about um, player type two. Uh, those are the, uh, the, uh, the, the two guards, high usage two guards, Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade, Tracy McGrady in his prime. Um, that's, so that's player type two. Player type five, those are your well-rounded power forwards. So think at the very top level, think Chris Weber or Pau Gasol. Player type seven, uh, those are your high scoring, high usage point guards. So think Kevin Johnson or Isaiah Thomas. Uh, and then player type eight, and we're going to talk a lot about this uh, particular player type. Uh, those are your very versatile, multifaceted uh, wing players who uh, can shoot very well, distribute uh, as well. Not a lot of these guys, uh, but you know, think Paul Pierce, I think 
he's still sort of the quintessential guy for that group uh, today. Also think, you know, Joe Johnson uh, in that group uh, as well. Uh, but, you know, I refer you to the paper if you want to look at, uh, you know, each, each one of those groupings. And so for the player type combinations, uh, so, I, you know, have them grouped now. And so now I look at each team. And so I ranked each player on the team according to the efficiency formula used on uh, NBA.com. And that formula is spelled out actually on the next slide. And uh, sorted them and took, and so the top two efficiency scores uh, formulated the big two for that particular team. So as an example, the 2008 Lakers, their top two players were Kobe Bryant and Pau Gasol. So Kobe Bryant is a player type group two. Pau Gasol is a player type group five. And so their big two was two five. So that's how I denoted it. And in the model, you know, if uh, for extending that example, in the model, the, the 2008 Lakers, their, uh, their variable, their 2-5 variable is going to be denoted as with a 1, value of 1. All the other combinations are going to be denoted with a value of 0. So that's how I was able to quantify, uh, that's how I was able to quantify the player type combinations and in a way where you could put it in a data set and, and, and run a, a regression. Now moving on to team talent, there's that uh, uh, efficiency formula that I use from NBA.com. And so for each team, you want to quantify the overall talent. So I took the uh, season efficiency for each player on the team, and I weighted it by minutes played, and just summed it up across the team. And that, that gave you a, uh, a, a, a measure for the talent for the overall team. Uh, and so that's a number. And so that uh, clearly can, can, can go into a, 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 a regression model. Coaching for each team season, I took the coach who uh, coached the majority of the team's games and assigned that coach a value of one. All the other coaches were assigned a value of zero. So uh, again, using 2008 Lakers, they would have had 143 variables corresponding to all the coaches in the league since 1977. Each of those variables would be assigned a value of zero, except the variable corresponding to Phil Jackson. He would have a value of one. So that's how I quant uh, quantified that in a way so it could go into a model. And just to note, the final regression model didn't have anything close to 143 coaching variables because many of the coaches uh, you know, didn't have a you know, statistically significant contribution to wins, either positively or negatively. So the, the ones that made it into the model had a strong statistically significant contribution in a positive way or strong statistical significant contribution in a negative way. So the model was pared down quite a bit in that way. So looking at results, so uh, you know I have the results here, and I'm going to dig into several of these in the in the uh, subsequent slides. But just going to point out a couple of them. So as far as the uh, big threes, so one very good combination was your high scoring, high rebounding center, your defensive oriented power forward, and your versatile three point shooting uh, wing who can distribute the ball. So that particular combination added. Uh, 5.43 incremental wins, all else being equal. Looking at a big two that did well, um, you know, if you look at your, say, a high scoring two guard combined with a versatile three point shooting wing player, that particular combination added an incremental 4.35 wins. So that was, that was a good combination. Um, you know, one of the more negative combinations, uh, if you had two sort of well-rounded power forwards, again, that's sort of in the mold of a Chris Webber, uh, combined with a low-scoring pass-first point guard, sort of in the mold of an Avery Johnson, that was actually not a good combination. And so, you know, you look at that one, ne uh, negative 8.47, uh, you know, contribution to win, all else being equal. So just, just drilling into a couple of these here, the, the very best big three was the 7-8-12. So you're high scoring, high usage point guard, your versatile three point shooting wing and your high scoring center. Those are the very best combination and, a, and an incremental uh, wins of 13.6. Uh, the, the very best big two was the 812. So that was a plus 7.59. Your versatile three point shooting wing, your high scoring uh, rebounding center. That was the best big two. And so, for me, the big takeaway here is when you have a high scoring uh, center, these guys are quite rare, you should surround that guy with a versatile three point shooting wing who can distribute the ball pretty well as well. Uh, so that, that was a the takeaway there. 
Uh, some more interesting results or interesting combinations. The 2-8, so your high scoring, high usage uh, shooting guard type of player, versatile three-point shooting wing again. Uh, we're going to talk about them a little later. That was a good combination, plus 4.35. And you can see some of the other ones that all include those that, um, uh, that player group two, the, those high scoring two guard. And the, the takeaway here, I oh, just want to point out the 2-2-7. Two, two, that was a, a negative. Uh, very negative combination. So those are your, your two high scoring shooting guard types combined with the high scoring, high usage point guard. Negative, uh, negative combination. So the takeaway is that those pl the player type two, they fit well with three point shooting wings who are versatile, well rounded power forwards, and also themselves. And, and that may uh, to a certain degree fly in the, in the face of conventional wisdom. I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Uh, but the data, the data shows that consistently that these combinations overperform uh, in wins relative to their talent and their coaching ability. Uh, one fit that wasn't very well was with uh, those high usage two guards with the high usage point guards, which I think, which I think you know, makes some sense. Um, another thing I wanted to point out was that player type eight. And you know, I've mentioned them several times here throughout this, this presentation, the, the versatile three-point shooting wings who can distribute the ball, they have a tremendous amount of what I call fit value. And so you know, these player types, they exhibit uh, an extreme amount of uh, fit within a team. They fit extremely well with almost all other player types except themselves. Uh, but they fit extremely well with almost all of the other uh, player types. And these teams that have one of these guys as one of their top two or three players, they consistently overperform expected wins relative to their talent and coaching ability and by the largest amounts. And so, uh, you know, in addition to, and I, I think some of the implications here are, you know, as, as follows. I think in addition to just having a team that's overperforming because of your fit, you know, you, I think another benefit is the flexibility you're afforded during drafting during free agency, during uh, trade season. Uh, for instance, you know, if you're, if you're drafting, uh, you know, you can always just draft the best player, best player available. You don't have to worry about reaching for a guy who may fit because if you have one of these guys as a top level player, you know, chances are the guy you pick is, is gonna fit well with this guy. Um, again, in free agency as well, you can go after anybody. Uh, in trades, you know, trade season, it affords you a lot of flexibility in putting together trades. And so, again, the quintessential guys, uh, I think today, Paul Pierce, uh, you know, I, I would also put Joe Johnson in there. And uh, also, Turkoglu in his prime, I think, w would fit that mold. Uh, but, you know, and just as a quick aside, going to Joe Johnson, I think, you know, there's been a lot of criticism of his contract. I'm not going to sort of, you know, make a comment on that, but I think a guy like him has a lot of value, sort of fit value that may not have been sort of previously ac accounted for uh, in players like that. And then conventional wisdom. I think that it was uh, partially confirmed as the majority of the worst performing combinations included uh, duplicative players. So the one big exception was there were those teams that had two sort of high usage shooting guard types. Uh, historically consistently overperformed their expected win total given their talent and coaching ability. And you know, I dug a little bit uh, further into the data and uh, one thing I saw was that nearly all of these, these teams played at an above median pace. And so it would you know, require, I think, uh, additional study, but I think that may be instructive on how those teams should play. If you have two of those type of players, perhaps you, know, you should play at a faster pace. And I think that uh, is, is another thing you can look at there. And I think that, lead, that leads me to my final slide here in uh, extensions to, into the research. So I guess one is incorporating pace. We just, just talked about that. So once you have a, a strong fitting uh, core of players, at what pace should the team play to maximize the talent of your big two and your big three? And also looking at role players. And so the role players here are in this study are accounted for indirectly through the team talent metric. But you know, I, I think it may be useful to look at, uh, I think it would certainly be useful to look at role players uh, in a more direct way. Uh, you know, although we know that a team's fortune are you know, disproportionately impacted by their top two or three players, you know, the role players matter as well. So once you have your, you know, your, your top two or three players, how do you best round out your team? So uh, 
that's the end of the presentation. I appreciate everybody uh, coming and listening. And I'd like to open it up for questions now. And if you could just use the, uh, the microphones there, I've been told. I, and I appreciate everybody for coming. Just out of curiosity, what player type is Dirk Nowitzki? So yeah, so Dirk, Dirk Nowitzki, he would fit into the player type five, the uh, you know the guy, and I, he's a unique guy. And so, you know, I was talking with someone earlier. I mean, essentially all players are unique, but you have to, just like someone said to me, you have to draw a line somewhere. But he would fit in that player type five, the well-rounded uh, power forward. Uh, and so he, you know he would fit well uh, in in that category. And and also just just to say, you know. Players were classified by on a season by season basis. So you know you could, uh, you know, conceivably a player could you know switch categories you know based on how they play in a certain season. I didn't try to distill a player's career into one category. So a guy like Dirk Nowitzki who came into the league, uh, you know, pretty early at a young age, you know, he he was actually in a different category uh, in his first two or three years and sort of and until he developed to the player he is and, and sort of settled into that player group five. Um, I had a follow-up question. Yeah. Um, your highest win percentage added for the big three looked an awful lot like the Spurs championship teams. Um, what percentage of that weighted effect do you think happened because the Spurs were so successful for so many years? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think that's a, a, a good point. It, when actually, I'm pretty sure that uh, Ginobili actually fit into the, um, the player type two, so more like a Kobe Bryant or Dwayne Wade. Actually, I think he was in that group. Um, so I, I don't think he actually went into that that player type eight, but to your point, I, I you know I think a good a good example of that top group was the Magic, uh, their finals team uh, a few years ago with Jameer Nelson, Turkoglu, and Dwight Howard. Uh, I actually think that was uh, probably a better example of that top that top group. Um, so you know you know we're dealing with data from 1977, so it's actually pretty good amount of data and uh, I don't think that there was a like a lot of you know sort of uh, you know disproportionate effect based on, on on one team first of all great paper thanks for your great work Thanks. I'm wondering why you want your clusters to be talent agnostic yeah if you're looking at the big twos and the, at the big three the top players yeah why not separate out those star yeah. players from the good players? Right. And so the point of that, and uh, and uh, I should have mentioned it earlier, was I want this to be a, uh, to apply to all teams. So not just the best teams, not just the teams with the best players. So you know, for instance, if you have a team that is a 20-win team, but they have the talent and the coaching of a 15-win team, that team is put together well. You know, they just don't have the you know top-level talent. And so really just wanted to tease out just the effect of the fit. And you know, when people, another thing when, when I talk to people about this, when they, they hear big two, big three, they, they automatically think sort of those top level, high profile teams. You know, I'm looking at it as essentially every team has two best players. Every team has three best players. So I'm classifying, so pretty, every team is gonna have a big two or big three. And so. Uh, so just just look at it like that as you know you want this to be applicable across all teams so I really liked your work uh, a couple of questions are just about the position so are they equally distributed as far as the amount of players in each uh, Cluster. I'm mean, as far as you're a player one, two, or three, and then a follow-up to that is, so obviously player twelves are position twelves are very valuable. You know the David Robinsons of the world, and player eight seems to be very valuable. Is there more of those players, less of those players? I mean, if we're going to try and find value in one of these positions, if, there, if there's a lot of people that can fit that role, then that'd be valuable to know. Yeah. But so, uh, so to answer your first question, um, yeah, I. I, I Sort of alluded to this in the, in the research in the presentation, as far as the number of players in each group, for the most part they are comparable, except for and I've touched on it, those uh, sort of uh, you know legendary Hall of Fame or Hall of Fame type centers. They're just um, 
very extraordinary. Their statistical profiles are very extraordinary, and as everyone probably knows, just ex extremely rare. So that one group, you know, had far less than the other groups, but the other groups were were comparable. Uh, and so, and I think that answers part of your, your second question. So yeah, so those, those player type 12, very rare. Uh, the player type eights, they're more of those guys, um, but still, you know, I'd say probably somewhat rarer than the average uh, player type group, uh, but certainly, you know, you know, not impossible to find guys like that. Thank you.